Coming up on Market to Market. New year, new you, and now new dietary guidelines. El Nino slams several states, bringing too much of a good thing to the parched region. And two brothers turn an FFA project into a money-making enterprise. Those stories and market analysis with Ted Seifried, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, January 8 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Federal Reserve Board members mulling a rate hike encountered more mixed economic signals this week. According to the Commerce Department, unemployment held steady at 5% last month as 285,000 jobs were created, the best three-month pace in a year. However, the Creighton University Mid-America Business Conditions Index revealed the continuation of a five-month decline as the mid-state indicator sank to 39.6, well below growth neutral. Oil prices plunged to 12-year lows as crude dipped below $33 per barrel. And Chinese stock markets in a tailspin over the devaluation of the yuan sent the Dow Jones Industrial Average to its worst start of the year in history, falling more than 1,000 points for the week. While an economic storm was striking Wall Street, Mother Nature whipped up storms of her own as severe weather hit the country from California to the nation's midsection. El Nino is proving his might along the western United States, again pounding the region with heavy amounts of rain. The much needed precipitation proved to be too much of a good thing as water rushed over roads, closing streets and altering traffic patterns in many portions of California. Flood warnings were issued for low-lying areas close to Los Angeles as more than an inch of rain fell in portions of the metro. Despite the uptick in precipitation from this El Nino, reservoirs remain at critically low levels. Five years of drought have left an impression on the region. The threat of mudslides remains high, especially in regions blackened by wildfire last summer. The blaze stripped vegetation and soil holding plants and has yet to regrow following the damage. The heavy rain extended into Arizona, where officials were asking Phoenix residents to be proactive instead of reactive to pending rain. These sandbags were used in lower elevation locations, those in the higher elevations readied for snowfall. The Mississippi River surge continued downstream this week. Major flooding is occurring on the Mighty Miss and the Ohio River and is forecast to last for at least two more weeks. The region will likely experience water at levels not seen since the Great Flood of 1993. Residents in the Magnolia State readied in their own way for the water. I said, well, it's not going to get as deep as it was before, and it did not come over the railroad at that time. So I said, well, I'm not going to worry about it this time. The moisture across the country the last few months is making progress on reducing the country's drought. According to data from the United States Drought Monitor, 68.6% of the contiguous U.S. is out of drought conditions. That's the highest level since May 31st, 2011. Much of the relief came from the El Nino storms that fell in the Pacific West. Every five years, the United States Department of Agriculture joins forces with the Department of Health and Human Services to publish new dietary guidelines. The two federal agencies replaced the ubiquitous term servings with instructions on how many cups or ounces should be consumed. The results of the new menu parameters received mixed reviews. Federal authorities this week released their much debated new dietary guidelines, which attempt to improve the eating and drinking habits of Americans. 
The guidelines do not discourage Americans from eating meat, as some experts had advised, but instead suggest a wide variety of proteins, including seafood, lean meat and poultry, eggs, soy products, nuts, and seeds. The document, updated every five years, advises the public on healthy eating and is used in establishing standards for school meals. The new guidelines ask consumers to watch added sugar, so it amounts to less than 10% of daily calories. Shifting to unsweetened beverages is one easy starting point in trying to meet that goal, the guidelines state. What most people forget is that there's calories in those sugar-sweetened beverages that aren't also nutrient-rich, so helping them get to that healthier place for a healthier weight, but also to prevent chronic disease like diabetes or high blood pressure. The dietary guidelines developed by the Agriculture Department and Health and Human Services also suggest getting less than 10% of calories from saturated fats, ensuring that whole grains represent half of grain products consumed, and eating a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. The North American Meat Institute, which was among those lobbying on the issue, praised the report's conclusion that meat and poultry can play a role in a healthy diet. The Sugar Association, however, said it was disappointed in the added sugar recommendation, which it feels was based on weak science. Federal officials hope some of the small changes they recommend might make a big difference in America, where about half of adults have at least one disease related to inactivity or poor diet. Many in America can attest to projects that outgrew the garage and became an integral part of their business lore. Noteworthy examples include Apple, Harley-Davidson, and John Deere. While many small businesses with humble beginnings never achieve multi-billion dollar status, the entrepreneurial spark has been responsible for keeping more than one family on the farm. And as Delaney Howell discovered, one pair of Missouri brothers added their names to the list of those who started small and now stand tall. As of September 2015, the USDA estimated there were 23.6 million cage-free hens in the United States, nearly 7% of the entire domestic flock. The Stanton brothers of Centralia, Missouri, count their birds as part of that figure. Dustin, 23, and Austin, 19, built their business with hard work, and after nearly a decade of diligence, they are the proud owners of the nation's largest free and open-range egg operation. But the roots of Stanton Brother Eggs stretch back even further. The business actually started in the first grade through a 4-H incubation project. Um, the class incubated six baby chicks, and from that project, one of the kids got to take them home. Um, I was the only kid <laughs> that wanted those baby chicks until the very last day and then another girl also wanted them. Um, she put her name in the hat to try to win them and she did win them. <laughs> uh, I came home a little teary-eyed but my uncle was here and I told him my predicament. He ended up buying me my first six baby chicks um, and that was how it started and it was just an allowance at that point. Dustin's first attempt at raising chickens included an old chicken shed that had fallen in, some five gallon buckets and a set of old chicken feeders. Since then, the operation has grown to nearly 20,000 layers in five buildings. And recently, the pair built a state-of-the-art structure along with the help of their father. The brothers prefer brown highlines and bow veins as their breed of choice because they are easy to handle and convert small amounts of feed into large eggs. In 2007, Dustin joined the FFA and bought 500 layers to use as his SAE, or Supervised Agricultural Experience Project. Following the leap in egg production, the brothers decided to jump into retail, selling their bounty at the Columbia, Missouri Farmer's Market. For the first three weeks, they faced horrible weather and low sales. By the fourth week, they were ready to quit, but they ended up selling 40 to 50 dozen eggs. The bump in pay was enough encouragement for Dustin and Austin to continue traveling to Columbia, Missouri every Saturday morning in the summer for the past decade. The pair sell an average of 400 to 500 dozen eggs every week. Karina Smith, market manager for the Columbia Market, has worked with the brothers since beginning her position as the manager for the past three years. Uh, I think customers have kind of the same feeling as I do. You know, they really 
um, they appreciate, um, you know, that the boys started this as a, you know, when they were younger and they worked their way up to as successful as they are now and, and they all love their eggs too. Their farmer's market stand is visited mostly by returning customers who look for the iconic giant stuffed chickens. Dustin and Austin also count college dining halls, numerous senior care facilities, restaurants, bakeries, and supermarket chains among their customers. Weekly rounds include Hy-Vee, Schnucks, and Dustin's alma mater, the University of Missouri. The Stantons got their product onto the shelves of a Missouri Hy-Vee after customers recommended their product to the store management. Sarah Bartel Fuller is the assistant merchandise manager at the Broadway Hy-Vee in Columbia, Missouri. They're our number one selling egg for sure. They um, even outsell our Hy-Vee Health Market brand, which I'm probably not supposed to say, but they are a very good selling egg. The Stantons have lived within a mile radius of their original homestead in Boone County, Missouri, since the family emigrated from Ireland in 1845. Although the details of the Stantons' lineage are murky, Dustin and Austin have been either the sixth or seventh generation to be involved in farming in mid-Missouri and have a desire to remain on the family farm for as many years as possible. And it's not really the business as a goal, it's just staying on the farm. That's been the main goal for both Austin and myself. We've always wanted to stay on the family farm and it literally can't sustain um, three families in the future, both our parents, Austin and myself. And so to kind of diversify and get away from it, I've kind of counted the egg business and the Stanton Brothers side of things as our off farm while being on the farm income. <laughs> so we're still able to help on the farm with the daily st things with the cattle, the crops, the mechanics and things like that. But the eggs is what helps keeps us here. Diversification and expansion are always on their minds. The brothers were intrigued by their ancestors' involvement in the potato industry and Austin spurred a transition to expand their operation. My brother had a paper he, had, he wrote for his, I guess, senior year. Um, so I found his paper and I'm like, potatoes, that's a great idea. So I ran with it. And it also goes back to ancestors. Whenever we came from Ireland, we came from the potato famine and they grew potatoes in Ireland. So why not grow potatoes now? The Stanton brothers are kept busy with more than just eggs and potatoes. Both help their father manage 400 acres of Milo, which is used to feed their flock. They also help with the family's 80 head cow-calf operation, and recently the brothers expanded operations to include a honey-based ice cream, which they sell at local retail outlets. As far as splitting everything up, Austin's very hands-on, and so he's actually going to school for an ag systems management degree, which is a more hands-on degree. And so he does a lot of the production side of things, um, and I do a lot more of the book and record keeping things. The two are well aware their success was made possible with the help of their parents, Andrew and Judy Stanton, as well as their three part-time employees who help with day-to-day -day operations, including egg collecting, washing, packaging, processing, and distribution. Almost all of their business expansion has been by word of mouth, as was the case with Hy-Vee, which has given the boys more time to spend on other aspects of their business. I'm at that point where I'm kind of just focusing on the business and I have been out of school almost a year now and I come to find out I have less time now than I did when I was in school. But even as the business continues to grow and expand, their true success lies with the bonds cultivated through generations of dedication to family and farming. Working as a family farm is, it's very a cool thing to do because Whenever you're thinking about a family business, you think everyone works together. And whenever you sit down to eat or go on a car ride, you all know what's going on with each other's lives. And so it's just really good because you get to build that communication with your family, get to know what's going on with each other in their lives. And you also get to work together. So it's a really neat thing to do. For Market to Market, I'm Delaney Howell. Next, the Market to Market Report. Weakness in crude oil, poor export sales, and the possibility USDA will raise yields next week kept the grain markets relatively flat. 
For the week, March wheat gained less than a dime, and the nearby corn contract lost nearly two cents. Anticipation of next week's report and low export sales held nearby soybeans close to even, with the March contract gaining a penny. And March meal followed along, rising 3.20 per ton. In the sots, March cotton fell $1.88 per hundred. Over in the dairy parlor, February Class 3 milk futures rose 14 cents. In the livestock sector, it was back to business as usual, with the February cattle contract losing 392, March feeders declining $6.32, and the February lean hog contract moving a nickel higher. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index weakened, losing more than a tenth of a point. February crude lost 10% of its value this week, falling 388 per barrel. Comex Gold rose 37.70 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell more than 17 points to settle at 395 even. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Ted Seifert. Ted, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. We're always glad to have you here. I want to start this off talking about the wheat market. We saw almost a dime come into this wheat market. Where do we go next week? Well, that, that's a good question. And we've been talking about that for a week or so now. Uh, the very, very cold weather that you're seeing in the Ukraine and Russia, Black Sea area, uh, worried about some winter kill there with not a whole lot of snow cover, although that did pick up a little bit over the past couple of days. But finally, as those cold temperatures really hit home, that caused a little bit of concern there. Uh, we, we didn't really get too excited about it before it happened when it was in the forecast, but uh, we did react to it a little bit. So okay. hopefully we'll see some more extension to the upside. You do have kind of a nice little or potentially interesting bottoming formation in the wheat. Maybe you do give it a try higher, but of course that USDA report on Tuesday We'll say something about that. Any thoughts on the wheat numbers coming out on Tuesday? Uh, you know, I, I don't think the wheat numbers are going to be the big moving numbers or the big attention-getting numbers of this report. Uh, I think we have a fair handle on what our production is going to be. Yes, maybe winter wheat seedings is going to be interesting to see. Uh, but I think wheat is going to take more of a backseat to the corn and bean numbers, maybe be a bit of a follower. Okay, well, then let's move into this corn market because that is going to be, uh, the, could be a big mover on Tuesday. Sure. And we've got a question here from one of our followers on Twitter. This is from Marty in Buxton, North Dakota. He wants you to talk about the money flows in mm -hmm. the market. We've seen big net sellers right. in the corn market on the spec side right. anticipating bearish news on Tuesday. Talk to us about how, the, how a producer should prepare for that move Tuesday. Well, the money flow is an interesting concept because you've got two things sort of going on, and funds being a big part of that, uh, two big players. Funds, you know, really building a very strong short position in front of this report going into this report. It wouldn't take much of a neutral to slightly bullish report to get some pretty aggressive short covering coming in, especially since you have a little bit of a technical eyebrow raising triple doji day that you had earlier in this week, which kind of led into the strength that we saw here on Friday. <laughs> um, and then you also have your set of, of end users out there that have been kind of going hand to mouth as far as their needs are concerned. <clears throat> the market hasn't really given them the need or, or the feeling that uh, they need to extend out further as far as their purchasing is concerned. But if you give them a reason to buy, then you have two big market players that are going to need to be aggressively looking to buy and competing for bids. So <clears throat> let's see what this report has to say. If it's bearish, business as usual. I think we've, we've, we've priced in a lot of the potentially bearish news that we could see here, short of uh, a new record for corn yield okay. or increasing acreage. But uh, if it's not a bearish report, you could have a very interesting, uh, this could be very interesting. December 1st grain stocks might be the most interesting number on that report. Are you looking, if we get a big short covering rally, 20 50 cents, What's, what rally could we look at to see where it'd top out? Well, I think, I think 20 to 50 is a realistic number to look for. Okay. But a lot of that's going to depend on, again, that December 1st grain stocks number. Okay. So what that number is going to do, it's going to tell us if the USDA has production numbers right or not. Now, if you go back to what we were thinking last September, uh, yield estimates were in the range of 163 to 167, not the 169.3 that the USDA is at now. Um, so if that production or if those grain stocks numbers come in lower than expected, that would suggest that the USDA is too high on production and all of a sudden we're looking at a completely different balance sheet. Now it won't be tight necessarily, 
but it will be less burdensome. Right, a little stronger from the producer's perspective than it is today. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll see what that says. Well, now let's talk soybeans. What can we expect on that side? Same short position by the uh, outside investors? Yeah, you know, again, in, uh, grains as a whole, funds have been getting very short in front of this report. So it wouldn't take much of a neutral to slightly bullish report to get some of that short covering action coming into the market. And again, you know, if that were to start... Uh, your, your end users, your commercials might come in and want to fill some needs going further sure. as well. We uh, might get rid of this hand-to-mouth buying. Yes, at least that's right. Um, increase it. Absolutely. But I'm a little less uh, concerned that we're going to see grain stocks come in well below expectations for soybeans than I am for corn. Uh, but anything on this report that gives us a nice bullish number could be interesting, could see some fireworks there. So All we'll right. see. I again, if it's a bearish report, you wonder how much of that's already been factored into the market. Sure, we'll have the knee-jerk reaction lower, but does that mean that we need to take another big leg lower? It really depends on the numbers, but in, unless they're shockingly bearish, I'm not so sure that will be the case. Okay. Now, you mentioned a triple doji day in the corn market, and for those of you who wonder what that is, tune in to the Market Plus on our website. We'll talk about that. It's a chart formation. We'll have Ted explain it a little bit. Now, Ted, I want to move into the livestock markets. We saw a big turn from that two-week spectacular rally we saw in live cattle. Yeah. This week, stepped back almost $4. What have we done in this market? What's changed? Well, you know, we, we rallied off the lows for a number of reasons. But one, Packers really stepped up in a big, big way, uh, you know, to, to fill some needs. We also saw box beef prices on fire. Um, and a lot of that, I think, had to do with the upcoming weather forecast of some very, very cold temperatures. Uh, and, and that was going to give us some problems with keeping weights on. Um, since then, you know, we've been kind of waiting to see if, if cash was going to continue on this, this fireball of a run. Um, and, and towards the end of this week, we really got to worrying that it wouldn't, and with especially which go, with uh, the Chinese demand concerns and global economy concerns, that pulled us off our highs a bit. Uh, we had been running into some very key re uh, resistance above us. We had been testing it. We did it, I think, four sessions in a row. We really couldn't convincingly get through it. So now you've got some profit take, taking amongst all the other global issues going uh, that we've been having. But going forward. Um, you know, you really wonder weather-wise if, if we're going to get this cold snap to continue on for a period of time or if it's going to keep coming back in. If that happens, then we could have more difficulty keeping weights on. That could give us reason to keep some strength and some support in the market. If we go back to normal or above normal temperatures again, uh, it makes you really wonder if we shouldn't go test those lows at some point in the fairly near future. Okay, so it's really it's weather dependent and more importantly weight dependent. Weight dependent on this I'm, market. I think weights are, are the key here for the next couple of months. All right. Now I want to talk about the feeder cattle market a little bit. We saw coming off that December cattle on feed report uh, extremely low placements, worse right. uh, lowest in 20 years, I right, believe. Right. Since then, we've had a nice pop mm -hmm. in the futures and in the cash market. For January, are we going to see a lot more feeder cattle moving into these feed yards? You would think that that very well could be the case. I mean, the last two days might, you know, but that might be after the fact then already. So hopefully that will be the case. We, we really do need it longer term. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I think, guys, there's still some trepidation about whether this is a sustained rally. You know, a, a week ago, a lot of guys were saying, hey, this rally's here to stay. This week, we've very much brought that into question. So you hope you see you hope to see that, uh, but we'll find out here shortly. So in the short term, on this feeder cattle market, this six and thirty cent down week, uh, do we see that continuing? What what factors are going to be driving this feeder cattle? Again, market? a lot of that's going to depend on weather forecast for next week. But um, yeah, you know, I, I I think we could continue to be under a bit of pressure. Again, the global economic issue is maybe here to stay for another week or two. Um, and that could keep us on a bit of, de uh, of the defensive. Uh, but if you, get, if you can get the live cattle excited and going higher again, then I think feeders follow. Okay. Now well, let's move into this lean hog market. Uh, relative stability this week, relative which is stability. kind of a nice thing to see That's in the nice. hog market. Up a nickel. Where do, you, where do you see us going from here? Are we beginning to get this pork out into the hands of consumers. Yeah, and that's part of it. And you know, you look at uh, the supply curve going forward, <laughs> a little bit, of, a little bit of a tightening, tightening that going on there as well. So, um, yeah, I think we've had good reason to kind of come off lows. I think we got maybe cheaper than we should have. Um, so now that we've been able to bounce, a, a fair amount of it's going to depend on what happens with beef prices. If you really collapse there, you might lose some of that that um, uh, consumer demand that we've built up here recently. 
Um, but either way, I, I think the lows might be in now for, for hogs, and any bigger pullbacks might be good areas for, for us to step in and make some purchases. Watch that $55 area, 54 and change yeah, is the right low. And sure. Do you have an upside potential in mind? Are, are we establishing a new range here in Lean Hogs? I think it might take a little bit of time to crack the recent highs. Okay. Um, but yeah, you know, you wonder if you see something in the mid to upper 60s at some point. Okay. Uh, we'd love to see it. It might take some time to do it, though. Gotcha. Let the market adjust to this, yeah, this and, big supply. And again, you need some help from beef prices as well. If beef prices start coming down dramatically, that's going to cause some issues. Okay. Now, crude oil was in the news again this week. Sure. Lost 10% of its value in right. a week. Well, because it's under $40, has yeah. been for two weeks. Where does crude go from here? Yeah, you know, a lot of people wonder when and where crude turns. And uh, this was not a good week for crude. Um, the global economic concerns are, are a big deal there. Uh, certainly we made new lows, closed the new contract lows, 12-year lows for that matter. Uh, so you don't have anything immediately, both on a fundamental standpoint or a technical standpoint, saying, hey, here's where we bounce from. In fact, you could say that we just finished with a level of consolidation, and now that we're breaking out to the downside, this is another leg lower. So you wonder if something... Are we going to challenge the $30 mark? You know, and that, I think that's the big question that we should be thinking about. Okay. Um, I think there's a possibility we get down near that level, maybe not quite to $30, or maybe we get slightly below it and then bounce from that. Okay. That might be a starting point for a rally, but we'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ted Seifert. Thank you. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. But Ted and I will continue our discussion and answer more of your questions in the Market Plus segment available on our website. And while you're there, check out our social media channels. We also encourage you to take a closer look at the exclusive Market to Market Classroom. This online library lets you look back at our coverage of the business, technology, and science of agriculture. Be sure to let your local vocational agriculture instructor know about this free classroom service. And join us again next time when we'll examine the ripple effect of fewer cotton acres. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.